Times. Good afternoon to you, Lord Finkelstein. Thank you for joining us. Written a column in today's no, Times called Ceasefire Supporters Fail to Understand Israel. This is coming off the back, of course, of calls from Sadiq Khan. And now 350 Labour councillors have written to Keir Starmer demanding the same. Can you explain to us, please, Lord Finkelstein, why these people simply fail to understand Israel? Well, I've written a column about the film Exodus, uh, which was a book that came out in 1958 originally, led to a film in 1960 by uh, Otto Preminger, which starred Paul Newman. And it's a romantic vision of the foundation of the state of Israel. And of course, you could look at it and think, uh, well, this is a bit hackneyed. It doesn't include all the nuances. But it helps explain how Israel looks at itself and also how Americans uh, look at Israel. It's a vision, I suppose, of uh, Israel's foundation and why it sees itself as a uh, as a, a, a last refuge for Jews, that there had been uh, violence for centuries against Jews, and now Jews were going to protect themselves. And so those people who are calling for uh, ceasefires don't appear to me to comprehend that Israel is simply not going to live next door to a terrorist state uh, that threatens its civilians. It would go against the essence of what the state of Israel is. So it's not merely absurd for Sadiq Khan, who cannot even end knife crime on the tube, uh, to be lecturing everyone about how to solve the problems of the Middle East. Uh, it's also pointless because Israel is simply not going to allow it, uh, the uh, growth of a, of, a, of a terrorist body right next door to it. And as, as you wrote in your column, security is the biggest thing for the state of Israel. And that is that is why a ceasefire cannot happen. Before the Second World War, my grandfather uh, was not a Zionist. He was one of Germany's leading anti-Zionists. He really believed that Jews could live in Germany. And what happened to his family, the death and destruction uh, that was wrought upon it and the rest of the Jewish community, changed his mind, naturally enough, about whether or not a state was needed. Uh, once you've decided that really the sol part of the solution to the problems that Jews have had of safety in the world over centuries is the state of their own. And you've also realized that's the only place to which millions of Jews really could go after the Second World War. Once you've determined on that, you aren't going to allow uh, a, a, a state to exist next door uh, that threatens that security. So I mean, I, I do, I watched, uh, Sadiq Khan speak and say, uh, he recognized Israel's right to defend itself follow, immediately before which he'd said there should be a ceasefire. And you, you wonder what planet that kind of, uh, statement comes from really, because how can Israel defend itself and also have a ceasefire, leaving in place, uh, the, the, uh, structure of terrorism? And Keir Simon was much more clear thinking about this. I think he's, you know, my translation of this is, he took a reasonably strong stance to begin with. He then saw that there was quite a lot of opposition in the past. He was a bit shaken by it, uh, but he's come back to his original view in a fairly bold way, and I was quite impressed. You, you write very movingly in your family memoir, um, your own mother was rescued from the hell of Belson and found safe haven in Hendon in London. Lord Finkelstein, when you see today a 650% increase in anti-Semitic crimes in London, when you see Jewish schools have paint thrown on their doors, when you see Jewish children too afraid to even wear their blazers to go to school, how does that make you feel? Well, it's, it's frightening and worrying. And I, I write right at the beginning of my book, Hitler, Stalin, Mum and Dad, my story of what my parents suffered in the Second World War from both Hitler and uh, from the far left, from Stalin. I write about uh, my concern that this could happen again. Um, and it's one of the motivations for writing the book. But when my grand, my grandfather, Alfred Wiener, was one of the first people to warn about the rise of the Nazis. He, he first started warning about this in 1919. So well before anyone else had uh, really begun to do that. And he, uh, you can see in that some of the seeds of some of the things that we're seeing, this kind of growth of conspiracy theory thinking and a growth of uh, populism and um, the, the dangers to Jews of that, uh, that those, those uh, moves. 
But the other thing that you get is a sense of proportion. You know, my, my very strong feeling is we live in one of the uh, best countries in the world for someone to live uh, as a refugee family. Uh, and we, uh, that's who we, that's what we are. And uh, we love this country for uh, the peace and tolerance and stability we have. And we want to protect its special qualities. And do you s still stand by that? Do you still think that this is one of the safest places for refugee families? Do you feel as though it is peaceful for those who are, who are seeking refuge? Is that how you felt in recent weeks when you've seen the pro-Palestine marches? Yeah. Well, um, no, I, I am shaken by those and I'm shaken by, uh, actually, you know, my, my reaction to, for instance, the takeover of Liverpool Street Station yesterday, uh, by these groups was, was two things. The one thing is I was, I was worried about it as a Jew. I don't think that it would be safe for me to go to Liverpool Street Station in the middle of that demonstration, which is very concerning. It's one of the first times I felt that in this country. But the other thing that I felt was, furious on behalf of most ordinary commuters who don't have a strong politics like I do, who don't, you know, spend their life writing columns in the Times, and who had were interrupted in their journey home by self-aggrandizing people expressing their political opinion and asking the commuter going to, um, to, to Cambridge, um, to, to, uh, to call a ceasefire in the Middle East. And you just sort of think, well, it's not they're not really going to be able to do that before they go home so i i do i do uh, i did find that um extraordinary and i'm i do think it's amazing that we now have these rolling demonstrations of a vast kind without any thought about the inconvenience it puts anybody else to so of course people have a right to free expression of their political views and political demonstrations are very important they are however only one right the right to go home after you've been to work is also a right that also deserves respect and there's a tension between these rights and I, I i was a bit surprised that we allowed the station to be taken over by people uh, you know uh, uh, involved in a conflict most people have no stake in at all quite apart from the fact that uh, for me it was certainly uh, quite frightening to to see and you know imagine this you can imagine that um for me or particularly maybe for some people who for instance might wear a uh, a, a skull cap which i don't do um and who are therefore more visibly jewish than i might look they might find that a very disconcerting thing so i i i um you know, to be fair, there weren't reports of violence. But then again, uh, to be fair, uh, probably nobody who was at risk uh, went anywhere near the area. And Lord Finkelstein, in your column today, you also um, reference a scene in Exodus uh, where the hero Paul Newman celebrates the idea that Jews and Arabs will one day live in peace side by side. After the events of October the 7th and what's followed subsequently, do you hope or think that that's still possible? Well, you know, Paul Newman delivers that speech over an open grave of uh, of an Arab and a Jewish uh, girl, an Arab man and a Jewish girl who've both been murdered in the very earliest days of the conflict. What a tragedy this is. And from the beginning, uh, there has been the possibility of Jews and Arabs, uh, Palestinian Arabs, living side by side, both having a state. Israel has repeatedly offered that to uh to the to various incarnations of palestinian le leadership it's not possible to offer it to hamas because it's that would be like offering it to isis it's not possible to do that uh, so hamas and their infrastructure does have to be fought uh, but i think it's possible to have uh peace you know with with you know my grandfather w was a was a considerable scholar of um islamic literature and um, he thought this uh, wonderful civilization was something that Jews would would benefit greatly from living alongside. And I feel the same. Uh, I, I think this uh, fight is an absolute tragedy. But the, the only way that it can be brought to an end is for both sides. And in particular, this is a call upon all those people who say, you know, Palestine from the river to the sea, something that... Um, you can also hear an echo of in extreme uh, 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 fundamentalist Zionist circles too. This is just um, not a route to peace. The land has to be shared. Everyone uh, has to be able to live in peace alongside each other. Uh, but let's not be wishy-washy in our thinking. Before that can happen, the, the Israel is going to now have to deal with Hamas and is going to have to destroy its infrastructure, its tunnel system and its leadership, because there's no peace for anybody, Palestinian or Jew, 
until that happens. And the people who are camping out in the stations and having these big demonstrations, they always know what Israel should not do. Uh, what, what, what it's a disaster for Israel to do. They never say, what should Israel do about the fact that this invasive force came into its country, killed one and a half million, you know, one and a half thousand people in most grotesque way, civilians in most grotesque way. And they say, as Sadiq Khan did, um, Israel has the right to defend itself, but never say how. Uh, and they thought that they leave to people like me the moral responsibility for for how and simply object to those methods well you know that's just um you know it's 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 very lame thinking to be honest lord finkelstein just before we we let you go i wanted to ask you about uh, more expected protests this weekend pro-palestine marches in various cities a, a large one expected in london we've heard swella bravman talking about them this week describing them as hate marches but sir mark Rowley of the metropolitan police uh, says words like jihad and the, the chant that you you just said on air there uh, certain chants such as that um he says he can't police good taste that isn't uh, within their scope how do you react to that? How would you like to see this be policed? Well, actually, look, I think all three of us would would be strong advocates of free speech, even when it disturbs us. Uh, so when I review um, any demonstration or any statement, um, you know, I, I prefer it when the police... Uh, err on the side of thinking something is a matter of political taste and judgment rather than a matter of law um but i have to say uh if someone threatens jihad it is ridiculous uh to regard that as not a violent threat uh, it's meant to be and it is um the the uh, the question of whether or not people should say uh palestine from the river to the sea is a different uh, matter uh, but i do think there's a question of proportion here and whether or not uh we ought to, uh, that it's reasonable that people hold these vast, very partisan, um, and to Jews, whether rightly or wrongly, quite threatening demonstrations, whether it's right to feel threatened or not, uh, can be held week after week in the central London, making central London effectively a no-go zone for Jewish people. That is, I am a bit worried about that. And, um, and I think it's right to, to ask that question. And there's a balance to be struck between people's rights to protest and the right of other people um, in the light of their of their protest taking over large parts of the city. Okay, Lord Daniel Finkelstein, thank you very much.